This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Okay, uh, good evening. This is uh, a meeting allowed to be virtual by order of Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. I'm going to call the council to order and then I'm going to ask Allison to do that for the school committee and I'm going to ask Austin to do that for the uh, library trustees. Then I will actually check to make sure that all of the people who are here from the council or the council uh, can hear us and we can hear them. And Allison and Austin will do the same for, for their selective groups as well. And then I will want to make sure because we have various other people who are uh, lead people for the schools, lead people for the library and for the town who are also on and we want to make sure that they can be heard and we hear them. Um, okay, so given that we have a quorum of the Amherst Town Council present, I'm calling the meeting to order at 5.32. Uh, Allison, you want to go? Yep, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee, I'm calling the Amherst School Committee meeting to order at 5.32 p.m. And Austin. There's a quorum of the Jones Library Board of Trustees calling the meeting to order at 5.32. Excellent. Okay, so let me start on the list of counselors. Um, Shalini Balmain. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Mont. Here. Reesmer is here. Haneke? Present. Dorothy Pam is working present. today. She's I'm present. present. Yep. Great. Evan Ross? Present. Uh, George Ryan? Present. Kathy Shane? Present. Steve Schreiber is going to be late unless he's shown up early. Okay. Andy Steinberg? Present. And Sarah Schwartz? Present. Thank you. Okay, you want to go ahead, Allison? Yes. Um, I'm going to go through alphabetical order, or at least try. Um, uh, Peter Demling. Present. Ben Harrington. You didn't see him, so we'll move on. Um, McDonald, present. Carrie Spitzer. Spitzer, present. Oh, and Heather Lord. Lord, present. Okay. And Austin? Alex Lefebvre. Present. Uh, Bob Pam. Present. Chris Hoffman. Chris, you're going to unmute. I did unmute. Can you hear me? No, yeah. we can't. Okay. Present. Tammy Ely. Present. Lee Edwards. Present. Hey, Lee. Uh, and Austin Sarah's present. Okay. And then also, I just want to check and make sure that uh, Doug Slaughter, can you hear us? We'd like to know we can hear you. So please unmute. Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Paul Bachman. You can hardly hear you, Paul. Uh, Mike Morris. Present. Okay, and Sharon Sherry. Here. And Athena, you're with us. I'm here. John <laughs> Hannon, you're with us. Yes. And welcoming back to the town of Amherst, we have the other Sean. Where is he? Hello, everybody. There you go. Sean, Good to you all. thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to, this meeting is a special meeting. There's no public comment. 
uh, there will be a many opportunities for the public to comment at other in other meetings of the whole council of the school committee of the library trustees as well as district meetings as well as other special hearings we have but this is the first opportunity for the council to get a glimpse of the new reality of our finances and i just want to say up front that a lot of time has been spent getting to the estimates you'll see tonight uh, but i want people to be totally clear these are estimates we are still in an evolving situation and whatever you hear tonight may not be the final word it is just what we know and how we know it for the time being hey, Rudy. So with that i'm going to ask paul to take over hey, Rudy, right? Thank you. So if everybody could mute themselves, that'd be great. Um, thank you for being here. And um, I brought my microphone down so people could actually hear me. Uh, as Lynn said, this is unprecedented, um, uncertain. Um, no one expected to be here. Uh, it creates a certain amount of anxiety for folks. And at a time like this, uh, we need our strongest team going forward. And so we're really pleased that uh, we have two new partners in a way. Sean Mangano is the new finance director for the town, and Doug Slaughter brings his town experience to the schools. So I think those two leaders on our financial end are really going to make a big difference as we um, ply our way through this section. Um, but since I have your attention, I do want to call out um, that uh, and recognize Sonia Aldridge's uh, work for the town over the, pa over the past several years. Well, 30 I won't say how many, over 30 years, Sonia, and I know you didn't want me to say this, but um, so, so she has uh, been more than just the um, accountant and comptroller and interim finance director. She has worked through the in intricacies of the numbers that you will see tonight. Um, she has been a core team, a core member of our team that has been managing the pandemic as we meet every day, and we've now throttled it back a little bit to about four days a week. Um, and she has made everything that we've been able to do possible uh, on the financial front. Uh, she's a no drama manager, as you all have experienced. Uh, she's a creative thinker, but with a firm grasp of the nuts and bolts. Um, she has carried such a heavy load for such a long time that I'm really pleased that Sean is here to help carry that load. Um, so I wanna just start with a giant thank you to, to Sonia. And just so you know, she ain't going nowhere. <laughs> She's not allowed to. <laughs> uh, although um, she did suggest, well, we, if we can start the, the slideshow, we'll talk, I'll tell you what, what she had suggested when we start the slideshow, Sean. So I don't, ha I don't have Sonia on my screen, but I should. You see me now? Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to present a slide show to you, a slide deck to you today. And so one of the things we were looking at this this morning, and Sonia was saying, you know, it'd be easier if you and I just climbed up on top of that roof and jumped, <laughs> because that's how our numbers were looking. So we can go to the next next slide. So what we want to talk about tonight is we want to tell you what we know. We want to tell you what we don't know. We want to talk about the variables that are in play. And we want to talk about what, what are the next steps, what, what, how we're going to move forward. Um, we will be talking about FY20. Uh, we'll also address uh, FY21 and, um, and open it up for discussion to sort of get guidance from uh, you policymakers. You are the elected officials of the town. You're the most important people in terms of where we're headed in terms of the town. So next slide. So we'll start with what we know. Next slide. So um, on April 23rd, this group got together and agreed to these three things. You agreed to um, have me submit a one month budget for to begin FY21. You agreed to have a FY21 budget on a, on a adjusted schedule that allows it to begin on um, August 1 instead of July 1. And you agreed on a schedule uh, for everyone to follow, both for the school and library to submit their budgets to the town manager and for the town manager to submit budgets to um, the town council. So next slide. Some of the things that we do know is that 
Um, the tax due dates have been extended, which means that our revenue has been delayed. We know that our third quarter revenues are on track and we're gonna get into a little bit of detail on each of these. We know that our fourth quarter projected revenues are somewhat reduced and that we have had unanticipated um, expenditures. And I just wanna mention that as we move into the third quarter, um, we talk about third quarter revenues, the third quarter report uh, that outlines exactly where we, are, where we are is available on the town's website under, under the accountants page. So next slide. So some of the things that we've done already, and we've talked about this last time, so I'm gonna go very quickly through these. Um, fourth quarter real estate and personal property bills, which were originally due on May 1st are now due June 1st. Motor vehicle excise, which were originally due um, on March 10th or later are now due June 1st. And water and utility bills, which were originally due on March 10th or later are now down uh, due on June 1st. Next slide. And that the, uh, up the time to apply for uh, exemptions or tax deferrals has been extended to June 1st. Um, interest and other penalties for late payment have been waived and we will not be terminating anybody's water or sewer services because of failure to pay. Next slide. So Sonia's gonna talk a little bit about where we are in terms of third quarter revenues. Third quarter to us is the period from January 1st to March 31st of 2020. So those are pretty solid, those are solid numbers because we know exactly what has happened. So Sonia, you wanna talk about that? I'm sure. So this slide just shows the percentages um, for this year versus last year, and they're pretty close. As Paul said, the detail is on the accounting website, and it's also on the packet for the Finance Committee tomorrow, which will be going through that if you want more information on these. Um, the general fund is slightly down 0.5%. Um, the enterprise funds are are in comparison to what we had last year. They were trending down because consumption was was uh, for water and sewer had gone down as well. So we were in the process of um, compensating for that when COVID happened. So as you can see, they, they did go down a little more with COVID here. On the next slide. They can tell you transportation is also down um, this year and it was last year. There's been um, different reasons for that. Um, partially a staffing for the parking enforcement officers. Um, there was some um, construction going on at, at certain meters and then there was equipment malfunctions over the last couple of years. So parking meters has been trying to catch, uh, parking revenues has been trying to catch up and, COVID's not helping us. And for the landfill, it's just a timing. Most of that comes in at the beginning of the year when everybody's buying their permits. Okay, where are we? Fourth quarter revenues. These are just projections like Paul mentioned. Um, these are our best guesses of where we're going from here. Um, general fund, we assume we're, we're projecting that we're gonna take in 99% of budget Last year, we collected 104%. So there will be a small revenue deficit, but we're, we're hoping and we're pretty confident that we're gonna be able to cover that with return to appropriations this year. Enterprise funds, I don't have actual percentages here. Like I said, we, um, we're gonna be looking into those more this week. And Paul, I think this slide has your name on it yep. and my name on it, so yeah, I don't... Yeah. We'll go, go the next it. slide. So just a note on, we 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 typically um, budget very conservatively on our revenues, and so being at ninety nine percent is we're usually over um, compensating for that. So we usually bring in one hundred and four percent of revenues just because we we project re, um, conservatively, and so that's why we're at ninety nine percent, which is about a five percent difference in terms of our revenues for the end of FY um, twenty, which is. Um, so it's 99% sounds good, but it's actually about a 5% drop from where we thought we would be otherwise. So uh, so in, in addition to FY20, we have some unanticipated um, 
expenses. As you can imagine, there's been some expenses for um, covering shifts at police and fire, particularly uh, when staff have, have been had to be quarantined or off duty or something like that. We've upped these hours for our people in our health department. We've added firefighters to make sure that we had coverage at all times. Um, and uh, we have purchased a lot of uh, PPE, which we all know about as personal protective equipment, uh, cleaning, cleaning materials, um, clean supplies, disinfectant, things like that. Uh, we continue to purchase PPE. We provide it uh, to as many departments as require it. We wanna make sure that our employees are protected and safe. Um, and just like the schools and the library, we've also invested pretty heavily into technology so our staff can work remotely. That includes software licenses and hardware solutions so people can be able to work from home effectively. Um, and then we had some costs that went into um, working with our partners to have options available for the, the people who are experiencing homelessness in town. So in case when we were um, setting up the Hampshire College shelter, there were, there were fixed costs that we had to be, uh, had to take on because that shelter had to be up and ready to run when we did the testing. Fortunately, we didn't have to uh, utilize that shelter because everyone tested negative, which is really terrific, but there were still some sunk costs in, in uh, setting that up. So you can go to the next slide. So basically, this just summarizes what we just told you and what the basic message for FY20 is that we're not gonna need any money from F to balance the, the budget in FY20. We think we'll get through it. Um, and if we, you know, we're monitoring it on a day-to-day -day basis, if we need to take additional actions, we will do that. But right now we think we're, we're solid through FY20 and we'll end the year in the, in the black. Um, next slide. So this is the, the section what we really wanna focus on. It's, it's what we don't know. So the next slide. So we, we tried, there's so many things that we don't know that we tried to sort of um, narrow it down to the basic, the most important things that would concern you and the members of the public. We don't know what the state is doing on, on local aid. We don't know what is going to happen with our economy driven revenue, which is re hotel, motel, meals, tax, parking revenue, um, things like that. And we don't know how long this event is going to, to occur and how long it will impact our budget. Those, those are the three major unknowns that we're grappling with. And, and honestly, your guess is as good as ours. We're gonna make some guesses and informed guesses based on all the information we have, but we'll look to the council ultimately and the finance committee of the council to say you're on, we're on track or not. So you can go to the next slide. So one of the things we want to tell you is where we get our money so you, so you have a context on why we care about these things because we are a revenue driven operation. We start with our revenues. Every time you've heard a budget presentation, we talk about our revenues and where the money comes from. So Sonia's going to talk about our revenue sources. So we have the four revenue sources that we have here and property taxes are largest at 66% and it's the most stable. State aid at 20% or at least it has been put it that way. And then local receipts at 9%. So, and then the other, which would be free cash, ambulance receipts, the CPA debt support and other miscellaneous um, sources that we use for budget. Um, next slide. The largest portion of revenue um, is property tax. It's the most stable. We will collect this. It's taxes. Everybody has to pay their taxes. There might be a timing lag. However, it will get credited for the year that the tax is for. So all the tax will be credited in 21. Next slide. These are yours. Yes. So the next, the, the big, one of the big unknowns is what's going the state is going to do. And um, we still don't know what the state is going to, to do. They figured it, figured out how to meet uh, virtually, which is a good thing. Um, but the, definitely the FY21 budget process has been delayed. Um, the, when they did the uh, budget hearing, they came out with a 14.1% decline in, uh, in, in revenues for the state. Um, which is pretty significant in terms of the budget. Uh, that's a 4.5, four to $5 billion out of a $31 billion budget for the state. Um, I mentioned they have a, a substantial rainy day fund of 3.5 billion. 
Um, and that's a good news story. And they also have received funds from the Federal CARES Project. And one of the things that's out there is that the, you know, the federal government is looking at an additional um, action to provide additional revenues to uh, local uh, states, to local governments and states. So we're hopeful that they will pass that. Next slide. So when they looked at, um, you know, again, no clear answers for 20 and 21, um, when they look at this recession uh, and they, how long it's going to last, the, the revenue streams for the state are just collapsing across the board, capital gains, income tax, sales tax, gaming and lottery revenues. Um, all the local option taxes are all, um, that flow into the state, all of these things are just collapsing under the state. So their revenue base, other than in, even income tax are dropping, but um, they have their own steady source. So they're gonna be um, struggling as they try to meet their budget demands. Next slide. And as we talked about last time, we, we, when this happened in 2008, during the, the, the Great Recession, as it was called, which will be maybe the not so great recession when it's put in comparison to this event, um, there were significant cuts in unrestricted governmental assistance, also called UGA, uh, by more than uh, 20%. And, but the state compensated by that by providing additional revenue sources to cities and towns of, of offering local option meals uh, and higher lodging excise taxes for us to compensate. So the big question, as I mentioned, is where where is the federal government going to step in? Are they going to step in? And there's a that's the big debate um, at the state house. I mean, at the U.S. Capitol, um, and we're fortunate to have you know we ha you know people in our state delegation who are who are able to sort of influence this and move it forward. So next next slide. Okay. So, so yeah, go ahead. Um, so this is our local receipts and um, these reductions that are on here, these are all based on um, the budget projection that we had almost balanced before. So this is being reduced from there. And this is based on hoping that we're back up and running by January of 2021. So it's pretty much halfway through the year. Um, we're, we're looking at probably a 75% reduction of hotel, motel, and meals taxes because those kind of catch up in arrears. Um, recreation revenues are, are gonna be 100% um, reduction. Uh, Cherry Hill and um, the camps, depending, that's mostly that mostly starts in July or this early summer months. So that's where most of that revenue comes in. So if we don't open up soon, then we'll lose most of all of that. Um, licenses and permits, it's just based on construction stopping. People aren't going to put additions or do new kitchens and stuff in a down economy. Um, interest on investments, that will go down. Um, the reason I didn't have it go down more is because we do have some investments in CDs that will come due next, come due after July 1, so we'll have that revenue. Otherwise, that would have come down more. And miscellaneous income includes, um, is mainly uh, college, Amherst College and UMass revenues, which are based on previous year's performance for ambulance. So that's going to go down for fiscal year 21, obviously, because this year, those revenues are going down. Next slide. And then other revenues that are impacted for fiscal year 21 are gonna be all the enterprise fund revenues, transportation fund, parking meters and ticket revenues. A lot of that's gonna, gonna um, depend on when we start charging for that again. Uh, ambulance receipts are down with the university closed. There were less runs, so we're counting. We can't count on re much relief from there. And the water and sewer fund it depends on college. Again, depends on college and university because they're the biggest consumers of water and sewer in the town. So as we start to look at this, we don't look at just FY20, FY20 20, FY21. Uh, we also look at, uh, we need to look forward to FY22 and FY23. So, uh, and that's how we wanna be very judicious with how we address our reserves that we have. Um, but so I want, as, as the policymakers, we need to be looking down the road. And again, this is just the first 
glance at some of these things. I'm sure the Finance Committee will be digging in much more deeply into all of these things. Um, we have if, we have no idea how long this will last. It it you know and how quickly the economy will be back up and running. So much of it depends on um, what the university and the colleges decide. We are on a call with the university representatives today. Um, asking when are they going to decide? They don't know. They thought June would be the earliest that there would be a decision as to what what it would look like when they come back. Um, Hampshire College has said that they will reopen as long as they're permitted to by the state, but that's just five or six hundred students, and you know it's really all about the university and the decisions that they make um, when they when they if they go virtual for this fall semester or longer than that, that has a gigantic impact on our on our budget and all of our revenue sources. So next slide. So we wanted to identify some of the variables that we we don't know about, but we wanted to say what, what are the biggest things that move that make a big difference? And these are the ones that matter most that we've identified. And you may have others that have come up, but you can go to the next slide. So we did a little grid and sort of made some um, things that we identified previously. So state aid is the first box, economy driven revenue, which is local receipts is the second box. And how long this goes on is the third box. And then we made some estimates that you'll see a little bit later saying that suppose state aid goes down 15%. Suppose the economy driven revenue is down for 12 months you know, or more uh, or loss. So you can pick a different date time there. And how long will we be at this? Before? And so how, how judicious do we have to be with our reserves? And other people may check different boxes, but these are the boxes that we checked for this scenario. And, and we will have be able to go through this as we talk about it uh, with everybody else's combined wisdom and decide where we want to be. Um, so the next slide. Okay, so um, this slide shows uh, where we were pre-COVID, where our, our budget was almost um, balanced. We were within $300,000 to balance the budget and things were looking pretty sunny. And then COVID came along and we did the three, we did three different projections. We did, what if we um, come back, we're back online within the first quarter, that's the bad. And then what happens if we, come back online January of 2021, halfway through the year, that would be the worst. And the worst isn't the worst. And then the worst is not coming back on until 2022. So if anyone does the math on this, and I won't mention any names, it's not going to balance to the to the numbers on the next page because this is just the revenue side of things. When you adjust revenues, if you look on here, you can see that property tax is straight right across the board for the bad, worse, and worse. But 21 was a little higher, and that's because we had a projection of 600,000 for new growth, and that's not going to happen. But we are pretty firm on 450, which is what's in the three projections. Um, local receipts. A lot of the local receipts change in that first um, first example, and it's straight across the board. There's only a few that get worse as you go along. So um, state aid is is based on level funding, based on fiscal year 20 um, projections state aid on the COVID was the governor's budget. So we had to go back to what it was for 20 and make that straight across the board. Um, other sources is like I said before, ambulance, uh, if we use free cash, it would go here. Right now, this is what we are using for ambulance receipts and um, indirect costs coming in from the enterprise funds and CPA funding for the debt. Those are the sources that are other funding right now. So if you go to the next slide, this tells you what the shortfall will be. So if you change anything in taxes or some of the revenues, if you change, the expenses are driven on that, like um, the unappropriated expenses, like the overlay, the provision for abatements and exemptions, that's based on the tax levy. So if the tax levy changes, that's gonna to change too. So that's why those numbers are not gonna balance if you're doing the math. 
on that. And then the little grid below where it's state aid, it's just telling you that if state aid goes down 10%, you can add 1.5 million to those numbers. 15% is 2.2 million and so on. You get that? Does, does that make sense to everybody so that, you know, um, oh, I'm showing, showing things with my mouse, I can't. Uh, the, the first uh, row is with shortfall from initial guidance. And so that shows what we will, from what we had projected to be our budget, what the shortfall will be. And then we can monitor what happens at the state and we can say if they do 8% reduction to us or 10% or 15, we know exactly what that number is going to be. And that's gonna come into play a little bit later in terms of how we make our recommendation to you. So you can go to the next slide, John. So this, this is sort of the headline is that we are projecting a range of um, deficits of 3.6 million to 7.7 .7 million. It's a very broad range because there are so many unknowns. And we contemplated just narrowing it, but that's the reality is it could be much worse than wh where we are. It could be better than where we are. We just don't know. Um, and so that's, that's where we are in terms of what to expect. Um, next, next slide. So one of our things is not, it, it, we other thing, other thing, other variable we wanted to identify were the expenditures, because that's one of the ways other than increasing revenue, you can, you can adjust your expenditures. So the things that we have talked about uh, in terms of what are the variables that there are going to be variables that increase our budget. So anything that has to do with COVID-19 is going to increase our budget. If we have to buy equipment, plexiglass, um, hand wash stations, uh, if we want, or if we're seeking to open our libraries or our um, schools or our public buildings, we're going to be making a, a, adjustments to all these buildings. There will be costs involved. So there, that's a thing that will drive, drive the numbers up. If we are looking at services and programs, maybe there's some that go down, some that can, can go up. And then one of the other things is that we'll obviously be looking at any kind of operational efficiencies or reorganizations that can uh, save us money. Um, another potential variable, and Mike or Sean or Doug can speak to this, um, is regional school assessment and how that plays into this. Um, one of the things that we have been doing as a, as a good practice, as a best practice actually, has been um, putting money into our OPEB account, which is other post-employment benefits, which is health insurance on a regular basis. That's a high value, uh, important thing to do to maintain our, our, um, our good bond rating. Um, but it might be one of those things that we have to give up or reduce this fiscal year as we try to balance our budget and, and weigh whether it's more important to put money into that account versus maintaining a certain type of program. And then the other big item for us is our contribution to capital. We have worked so hard to get our contribution to capital uh, up to 10%. And I think that that's unlikely to be able to be, to happen this year. Um, so we will be putting off things that need to be done. We will be uh, delaying things, um, but there will be a certain amount of capital that we still have to do, but we really don't know. So we, we um, might have some things that we wanna present for the beginning of July 1, but hold on most of the things until later in the fiscal year when we have a better sense of what is going to happen with the economy. Okay, next slide. So now we wanna transition into where, where we're going, how we're moving forward. And go to the next slide. So we made some assumptions and these are assumptions as of May 11th and you know they may change May 12th. That's the way the nature of this beast has been. Um, we said suppose state aid is reduced at about the same rate as the um, state's revenues have been reduced. Say it's 15%. Suppose the revenue begins in January of 2021 and, um, and, and we are able to we would need $6.6 .6 million reductions from our original planned budgets. Um, so one of the things that we will talk about with the finance committee is that, um, one, as we say, how do we fill that $6.6 .6 million gap? We'd say, well, suppose we level fund, not level service, but level fund the three major departments uh, budgets, library schools and uh, regional schools and uh, the town four budgets, I guess, and um, and say, you get the exact same appropriation that you had for this fiscal year. There's no no uptick at all. 
and it's you you just deal with that and now that means that there are contracted things that are going to go up there's some things that will go up some expenses will go down um, but we would depend on each of those entities to make a decision about how to manage their funds um, suppose we reduce our contribution to OPEB and that could save several hundred thousand dollars. Suppose we reduce our commitment to capital for FY21. Again, a major source of, of a way to plug that hole. And then one of the things that we would look at is um, for any reduction in state aid, we would look to utilize um, our, our reserves to fill that gap. And so there's a reason for doing that in that because we don't think the state is going to um, make a decision on state aid anytime soon. Um, so one of the reasons for tying state aid to our reserves is that we can move forward with our operating budgets right now, which is what we want to do, because there's a certain urgency to getting our one month budget approved and then our FY21 budget approved for a lot of um, labor uh, decision, labor, labor reasons and other things. So um, tying our use of reserves to our state aid um, sort of pulls that out of the mix, and then we can work with everything else. So you can go to the next slide, Sean. And I'm sure you're all having a million questions about this because it's very complicated, and we looked at lots of different ways of presenting the information because they're all cross-cutting and things. So, um, so the things that are on the table for the calendar, we just want to run through the calendar, um, are the one-month budget, the FY21 budget, the regional school budget, the capital improvement program. So you can go to the next slide. So this is where we are. This is a, a chart that you have all seen before. Um, I just want to point out that we're at May 11th. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee of the Town Council meets, and they, they will begin discussing our budget guidelines that the council would like to provide to the town manager when, when I create the next budget. Um, and then um, that, hopefully, if there is a, a decision on that, that will go to the town council on May 18th, which is Monday, a week from tonight and the council will, will discuss that again to decide if that's the, those are the guide, guidelines that they wanna to provide to the town manager. You go to the next slide. And then these are the dates for when, when things are due with the idea being that the one month budget will be approved in June for the month of July and that the remaining uh, FY21 budget will be approved by the council by the end of July. July 20th is what we have on this calendar. Next slide. So we're, we're nearing the end. Um, so I just want to note that there's, we're in a good position compared to a lot of other communities. We have a lot of things going for us. Um, we, ha we have a strong um, uh, bank of reserves in our possession. Uh, we have good working relations, really excellent working relationships between the schools, the library and the town, high level of communication and um, knowledge of our operations. So we all know how everything works. So there is a dispositioning that ha you see happening in other communities. Um, and so that's a real benefit to us. So we can have really frank discussions about where everybody stands on things. Um, we have you, the policymakers, who are very engaged. And the fact that you're all here for this important meeting is just really a testament to your commitment to the town. Um, and one of the things that we know we are gonna have to do is we're gonna need to be adaptive. We're going to be need to be um, responsive to the situation because we really don't know what's, what, this, what this pandemic is going to throw at us next. Um, we feel it's really important as we talk about FY20 and FY21 that we're also talking about FY22. And once we get FY21 wrapped up, we will be turning right around to start talking about FY22 because typically in October, we would be coming back to this group and talking to you about the projections for FY22. So these are all part of a continuing dialogue that we're gonna be having with you and, and through you to the public. Um, so one of our challenges here is um, what I've been calling this year, I, I had it under a different idea, was to call it a bias for action, that this isn't a time to be active. Um, we want to bring our community back but it doesn't have to look at this in the same way uh, or form that it has been in the past. And I think, you know, businesses are adapting, industries are adapting, and government needs to adapt as well. And we will look at everything with fresh eyes to decide maybe, you know, this is a new way of doing things and maybe it's better than the way we used to do everything. We don't have to go back to the way we've always done it, but maybe, there, maybe there's a new normal that we um, 
I don't like new normal, but that's where we're where we might be. Um, so can you go to the next slide? So we are not um, really into this very far. You know, we've only been at it for a few months and it seems like an eternity, especially for those of us who've been working it every day. Um, but I think that, you know, as the governor begins to speak about reopening the economy under certain uh, guidelines, that we, I anticipate that he'll be saying something on May 18th about this. He's made some announcements on some things already. Um, the big um, conundrum they have to fix is what to do about childcare and taking care of children so people can return to work. That is a giant challenge for people um, and for, for the governor and for the government to address in terms of what are the rules for that. So, um, and that impacts everybody, impacts our, our, our operations, it impacts everybody. So we're at the beginning of the end, we hope, or what is it, the end of the beginning is where we really are. So, uh, next slide. So, um, <laughs> welcome, Sean, <laughs> to this new reality. And it's not what you really had bargained for when we've started talking along these ways, but um, we're really glad that you're here. Um, you know, Sean, as you all know, is, is, a, is a big picture, creative thinker. And um, I think with Doug and uh, on the school side and Sharon and Mike and Sonia, I think you ha you should feel comfortable with our, our management team as we start to go through this, but it can only get better through dialogue and through conversations with you. So right now we sort of op open it up for any kinds of questions or comments that you may have. And, um, you know, I, I just tell you, these are, these are numbers that we w felt were important to put out there uh, to, to start this conversation. So with that, Okay. Madam President. Um, thank you. So let me first of all start by saying thanks to all of you that have contributed to putting this together. Um, I want to thank Andy Steinberg, who comes to, with us to us with experience of having been around during 2008. Uh, and he has really helped by asking all of the tough questions. Uh, and when we thought we had them all answered, he'd ask some more. Um, I want to particularly, however, recognize Sonia and all of the work that Sonia has done on our behalf over these many years. For those of us that are new to the council, we got to know Sonia better, uh, though some of us knew her before. And she has been just a stalwart in helping us all understand how the budget works. Uh, how the different pieces go together. When I want a straight answer, I go to Sonia. And Sonia, we're glad you're not leaving us. Uh, and since we know you were one of the people that wrote a letter of recommendation for Sean, we can't even be upset that he's come in to actually be the finance director. So oh, Sonia, thank you for all these many, many years that you've served the town of Amherst and we're glad you're not leaving. So with that, I also want to recognize and just point out that Mindy Dom, who will be joining us next week as part of our meeting, is in the audience tonight because she wanted to hear this presentation and understand from the perspective of the town where we are. And Mindy and her colleague, Joe Comerford, have been working with us extremely closely from day one, asking what do we need and making sure that they were filing bills and supporting bills that continue to get what we needed to continue to move forward as a government. So with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions and we'll start with, um, the first hand I have is Austin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Thanks for the presentation and thank you to Sonia for the work in putting it together. Um, I know the answer to this question is gonna be, it's too early to tell. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of that answer, but my question is, uh, at what point do you think about uh, personnel issues, personnel reductions in the town, the schools, and in the library? Or how do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So we, am I frozen? Okay. Um, we are a personnel driven organization. Most of our um, salaries and benefits, uh, most of our budget is salaries and benefits. Um, so anything that we want to do of any size impacts our personnel. 
Uh, we have not announced layoffs or furloughs. Um, other communities have. Uh, as we, I think we will work from our operations to determine what we need in terms of operations and then go from our operations to where what kind of personnel we need to support that. But I think we don't start straight with personnel. Um, we are not hiring people at this point unless absolutely necessary. It's not a hiring freeze, but it's a it's a it's a frost. I would say you know we're we're looking at everything um, pretty seriously. If anybody needs needs to be hired, um, it has to come through me for the town side. Thank you, Paul. All right, Kathy. Um, I want to thank you for um, all the work that went into this, and I don't know whether I thank you for the sobering scenarios you give us or not, but um, I, for one, am really glad to start to see some numbers put on it. So as, as you mentioned, finance will be meeting tomorrow, and what I'm hoping is we could get a little closer to where you've created a, a possible way of approaching it, which would be to cut capital down to the bare minimum. And when I was looking at what we had been planning on capital, there's as much as 3 million or 3 plus million in cash that was set. So, you know, so are we saying spend 3 million less than we were planning on it, you know, put some kind of number on it. And OPEB was supposed to be 500,000. Are we saying cut it in half, cut it to zero? So that gets me to how much we would have to draw on reserves. And if I just do back of the envelope, I start to get reserves. If we go anywhere near those numbers, reserves would, the draw on reserves to get to the 6.6 .6 million in savings would be about the same as your guesstimate of state aid cuts. So it's kind of a nice match. So I just, tomorrow, I think it would be good to get to some of that granular. And then the other thing I was wondering is in terms of guidance, when we um, go beyond just, if we said flat budget, keep it to last year's operating budgets, if we know health insurance is going up, um, are we gonna provide any additional like places to look? Um, a lot of large corporations, not, I wish more, the top paid people have taken a voluntary cut in pay for a certain amount of time to ease the frontline staff, um, postponed any planned uh, step increases indefinitely, but any kinds of guidance on ways to live within a flat budget. So Austin led off with personnel cuts. I mean, clearly those are always there, but so I had those two general questions on more specificity tomorrow. And then the last was you talked about more expenses in the last few months, but by June, I would think you'll have some, where have there been some savings, not savings we would want to have had, but we're using less gas and driving cars around as staff. Um, is utility costs down? Is overtime down if the drawn EMT racing back and forth to the hospital is down. Um, so I don't know when we'll have a hold on those numbers, but is there a little bit of um, a, a, a buffer there on some potential savings on what we thought we were gonna be spending this year? So those are three buckets of questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm freezing up, I hope you can hear me because I heard everything you said, Kathy. Um... I can hear you. Okay, uh, and Sonia may want to jump in here. Um, so in terms of, um, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and we haven't discarded any tools. So all the things that you mentioned are in the toolbox and we will look at those and look at them and see how they can all be put together to, make, to meet our goals. So um, so there, we're not, I'm not saying to, on anything in particular. And I know people's minds go to certain areas automatically and it's because it's people driven, that's, that's what the most important thing. Um, and if we were to talk about those things, I'd certainly be talking to our employees first to make sure that they understood the, the gravity of the situation. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how the specificity of the numbers, we, we, we went back and forth about how detailed to be today to, for this meeting. And we thought that it was more important for to talk about the big picture and to understand the, the magnitude of the situation. It's at the finance committee that um, we can talk more in detail about how all those numbers sort of uh, work together. 
And, you know, and, and obviously we've gone through our own little scenarios and Sonia can go into those tomorrow with, you know, exactly how we think we can get there and what things we would be um, uh, dealing with um, and how it would look. There is a path. Um, it's not an easy path, but it certainly is a path to maintain our core services um, and be able to deliver what I think the people of Amherst expect and are used to. Um, but it will take some pretty serious um, introspection from our management leaders to look at our operations to say, do we really need this? Is Are we gonna survive with this? And how are we gonna build in all of our collective bargaining and contracted employees and uh, um, contracts that we have already signed that we've agreed to? Or do we go back to, you know, there's lots of things we can go back to the bargaining table and start these conversations. There's so many things that we can start to talk about but our mission for this is to, is to show you tomorrow, here's how it could look. And you can say, we don't like it. Here's where we want you to refocus your energy. Thank you. I wasn't expecting more tonight, but I was mm -hmm. just thinking that we have to pivot. And yeah. then, no. Thanks. Add to that. Oh, Sonia, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Um, I just want to point out that there's really two things are balancing here. There's the overall budget picture of how much money there is um, that covers everything, OPEB, capital. There's the big picture. And then within that, we're saying level funded operating budgets with the four entities. So they're going to get a number and that's the number they're going to work with. And they have to, um, everyone has to work together to to figure out how they're gonna balance um, any increases in pay for COLAs that are already voted or health insurance, that's all part of that. So there's like two separate pieces to it. So everyone's got their portion that they're working on. Okay, thank you, Sonia uh, and Paul. Alyssa, you have your hand up. Why, yes, I do. Thank you. I had a couple of things. And again, this is, you know, don't answer tonight, right? It's just to be prepared for the next thing. And so we've already touched on collective bargaining in a couple of different ways. And one is, and so in our next report to us at some point, please remind us where we were already in collective bargaining agreements, like when they were expiring, if we were still working on any of them, and then separately, what level of communication you've had with them so far, right? So Obviously, in a normal world, you'd be talking to people in town hall and having lots of meetings and talking to us. And you might say one is confidential and one isn't. Well, you don't have most of your people in town hall. And so are they just watching this and hearing it for the first time? And I'm not asking you to answer that. I'm just saying to be able to, so us, we can tell the public, this is how we know that the employees were informed. This is when the employees are going to start talking about it, you know, separately kind of from the actual collective bargaining process just so that we know based on everything you've told us so far that you're going to be including employees and in what could we do differently what what might you know what is our creativity and we know and we're counting on you to do that and we just want to be able to continually reinforce that with our community that we're going to be doing you're going to be doing that for us mm -hmm. the other thing on a completely separate note is as we move forward and we start talking about what things we won't do and so OPEB is actually pretty easy. Of course, I say that because I hate it, but OPEB is pretty easy because it's like it affects our bond rating. It's a long term project. It's obviously something one can do differently in the short term. A lot of other things aren't that simple of a trade off. And so, for example, people have already talked about not taking the library grant. Whereas I keep saying, wait till you see the figures on how much the town's share is going to be of repairs. And you'll see that it's the same amount as the library grant uh, that we'd have to pay for the library grant. So don't be short sighted on that. And the reason I say that is because we need to be able to explain to people, what does this million mean? You know, what does this $200,000 mean? And what would it buy us instead? Because people, the, the scale, you know, is just it, it's pretty big. We have a pretty big budget. And for people to understand, okay, well, this is what it means for sidewalks. This is what it means for road repairs. And this is what it means for that building we were thinking of doing something with. I just think that we're going to have to continually think about stuff that's really obvious to you and maybe to some of the town councilors is not at all obvious to our community. What, if they give up this, what they can buy for it and is that worth it? And that way we can get much better input from our community as we go through this. Thank you. Any comment on that, Paul or Sonia? No, 
No, I, th um, I think that those are all uh, really good points. And um, in terms of, you know, you are the, as the, as the policymakers and elected officials, you're the, the ones we talk about this, these things first as we start to lay the groundwork moving forward. Okay. Allison McDonald, please unmute. My, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, no. we can. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Paul and Sonia, for the presentation. You've made um, what we all know is a really complex and um, situation with a lot of uncertainty. Um, your presentation makes it look um, simple and easy to understand. So thank you for that. Um, the, my question is, is really very, very simple and, and sort of big picture. You describe that your assumption assumes recovery begins January 2021. Could you describe a little bit what, what that means, what you mean by recovery begins or back, back up and running um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, yeah, parking, schools, um, uh, UMass, all, all, of, all of the things that sort of go into what you're assuming is back up and running? Sure. So um, again, those are, uh, we, we talk a lot about, you know, state is, is one big thing and that's a separate conversation, but then the other big um, variable for us is the economy driven revenue. What are that, what's that revenue? It's uh, meals tax. It's, um, it's the hotel motel tax that we get. It's the agreements we have with the university and the colleges to, and it's um, parking revenue, quite honestly. And so that requires a robust, uh, downtown and robust business community throughout the town that's active. Uh, there are people living in town who right now a lot of our population is is not in town and that's not unusual for the summer. Um, but in the summer we usually have a lot of people in town who are going to weddings and sports camps and things like that. There's a lot of flow that's all going to be gone this year, this year. So what that looks like is that the university and the colleges are in session uh, the downtown businesses and the, and the neighboring businesses are up and running and they have customers in it. Um, we are talking about it with the bid in the chamber and other people in, in town about, you know, will there be new rules about how you open businesses? Will your, popu will your um, occupancy at a restaurant be 50% of what it used to be? And does that cut down on the, the amount of um, meals that can be served? Um, you know, there's all those different variables. And so we just sort of picked a, a date. And the other thing that um, you should be aware of is that there's a lag time from when they suppose the economy really opens up January 1. We don't really see that revenue. We don't get the first two months of that revenue. We haven't really seen the, ex uh, the experience where, where there's about a two month lag between meals tax getting into this, to the town from when, it, when they were actually paid at the, at the door, basically. Superintendent Morris. This will be quick. I just wanted to go back to um, Austin Sarrett's question earlier. Um, so we are under an obligation, um, there's actually a state law around it that we need to notify staff by June 15th uh, if their position, if they won't be coming back uh, because of budget situations. So, um, you know, we'll be in those conversations the next couple of weeks at school committee, uh, but we have to notify folks by June 15th. Otherwise, um, they're with us for the next fiscal year. For, for people in a bargaining unit, I should say, which is the vast majority of our staff. Okay, Mike, please, um, in the future, just raise your hand if you wanna chime, I'm over on the um, raise your hand portion, if you wanna chime in on an answer and the same thing for Sharon Sherry, okay? Sure, thank um, you. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Just a comment <clears throat> about the library. Uh, given the fact that we're not sure how long this pandemic was going to live amongst us, uh, there has been some discussion that the plan for the library would need to be greatly redone uh, in terms of how people can do the things that people want to do in a library, but within safer social distancing. And this may, be, this may apply to um, certainly the plans for the schools and uh, all of the projects that we have been talking about that are past design may not suit where we're going forward. So I'm curious to know if, if uh, comments on that. Okay. Uh, Paul or... Um... So, so we certainly are looking at what it looks like going to, through the future. We uh, are looking at any kind of contact with public to the public in terms of whether that's going to even be possible and what it would look like. There are no easy answers. Every community is having the same conversation. I know uh, Mike and Sharon have also 
talk to their colleagues and they're all thinking along the same lines of what's what's education going to look like what's a public library going to look like no one has an answer to that but there's because we don't know what the new reality is going to be if it's going to be that everything has to be socially distanced or or what you know so mike and sharon do you want to weigh in on that i don't see uh sharon yeah i mean i can I was, mike, oh, go ahead please go to sharon please Oh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Mike. Uh, so, but so maybe I m m misunderstood the question. I thought the question had to do with uh, the building project, and so regarding the designs for that, um, there has been no change from the MBLC in the construction grant program. Um, uh, the only word we've heard is we are not allowed to submit a different design within this grant round. Okay, and Mike. Yeah, so uh, the town manager and I have been um, in close communication with the MSBA. I think for projects that are in construction, that that's certainly gotten complicated for folks, and and there's a whole lot that, and and fortunately, unfortunately, we're not in that place. Um, so at the current time, they are not adjusting the project. I think the larger point around uh, what will school design look like two years from now when we're you know even a year from now we're actively in there i think it's a really good question i don't think we know the answer to that uh but i know the MB msba uh which is um as well as architects are, are actively thinking about what would it look like if, if this lasts a few more years hopefully by the time this building uh fingers crossed would be built you know five six years from now this would not be a factor but i think it's it's making all of us i think beyond education circles just rethink uh, what do spaces look like? What do interactions do we want to look like? What flexibility could spaces have that they don't have, uh, they don't currently have? So uh, we're not as far along as the library, so we're not in that place. But I think for for everyone, I think it's it's making us rethink uh, spatial relationships and and how they get set up in buildings. So um, I can't get more specific than that based on where we are and what we know. But that'd be my response. Okay, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Thank you. A couple of questions, most of which I don't expect can be answered tonight, but um, I thought I'd put them out there for maybe finance tomorrow. Um, one is a follow up on Kathy's. I did the back of the envelope too, and a level of funding saves about 1.7 million. The OPEB, as she said, was a half a million. And then the cash capital is around 3 million. That only adds up to about 5.5 million. Um, but your slide said $6.67 million gap. Um, without intending to use reserves to fill the state aid gaps, which aren't really that high in the presentation you made. So I would want to be looking at an answer as to where that other million in gap might be coming from. Um, the others go to the unanticipated expenditures due to COVID. Um, where do we stand at this point on what we think will be reimbursable under either FEMA? the National Disaster Declaration or the CARES Act, given, especially with the CARES Act, how strict the um, reimbursement formula and ability is in terms of it had to be not just COVID spending, but I think I've heard that it has to also be unbudgeted. So things where you just shifted something within it might not be reimbursable. So an answer to that or some idea of what we might be able to for those unanticipated expenditures, be able to cover through those two options would be great. And then I know you skipped this tonight, but the enterprise funds, um, water, sewer, severe decreases. Um, I don't know whether solid waste is ex intended, or, you know, expected to decrease, but transportation, um, what does that look like on the expenditure side? where it does that mean that the council is going to be facing looking at severely increasing the water rates and sewer rates um, on the transportation fine side those normally fund things like the pbta the valley bike share what what are we looking at or what we expect to come in going to be able to fund some of that so thank you yeah so those are all um terrific questions um and we can get a little more in detail in, into the you know, substance of it tomorrow, I think is really the time to have that conversation. Uh, in terms of FEMA reimbursement, I am not, I think at the end of March, uh, I have not seen the April numbers yet. We had about $100,000 in, in identified expenses that were um, totally COVID related. Anything that's uh, attached to COVID is processed through in terms of a bill with COVID-19 
on it so we can so we're tracking every dime that we spend um i am not projecting funds to be reimbursed by fema or mima i'm hoping that they will um but i just worry that uh in this you know you've got every community in the in the in the country submitting the same types of things and whether fema's ever going to have enough money to to pay everybody back um i don't think it's wise to be spending money counting thinking that it's going to be it's only going to cost us 25 percent. it's not where we are we're i'm assuming that whatever we spend we're paying for 100 percent. if we get reimbursed by fema great we're going to go after every dime we can but i'm not going to count on that um so did i get all of them or sonia was there anything you want to add on those um i just wanted to say that with um theme with the uh COVID expenses we're pretty much going to be paying for that out of this fiscal year's operating budget and we won't get any fema money or or other money that's going to offset that for this year but like paul said if we do get reimbursed it will just go in as a um prior year refund so it it does come into our revenue stream later on the other question was regarding uh, enterprise funds yeah so enterprise funds you know obviously parking uh, parking and um tickets are a big thing so that's that's really economy driven uh and we do we and that that fund they each of those funds has a bit of a reserve interestingly i think our revenues from the transfer station are up a lot of people are at home cleaning and <laughs> trying to get rid of things and doing yard work and so um that's a side benefit, but it's a, it's a challenge to keep that operation operational uh, with proper social distancing for our, and safety for our employees. It's, a, it's really a big issue for us. Um, so it's, it's a, but for um, water and sewer, while our revenue, our usage might be down somewhat, um, you know, we do have reserves in those two accounts as, as you know, there, we have lots of different sets of reserves. There's not just one reserve that, that uh, the town has set up over time. And that's a really smart thing to have done. And the other other question was really about the gap, but I think that's where the finance committee comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Shalini. I don't know if this is a question, but more of a comment, especially in the absence of an economic development director at this point, but uh, just, the idea that how can we stay committed to thinking about creative ways to enhance our revenues for example you know we can maybe kickstart entrepreneurs by um making it making it easy for them to have pop-up commercial spaces like how can we remove these barriers um and another one that comes to mind is outdoor dining for example how do we remove the barriers for businesses to have more outdoor dining spaces? How can we promote more local food growing through removing barriers and gardening and stuff? So I don't know if that's a comment or question, but is there a team or someone who's focusing on thinking about all these different ways that we can support um, the growth? Sure, yeah, so we have thought about that. We have uh, uh, several of these things will require direct action by the council because if they include public ways or zoning or things like that um that would be we have some creative ideas that we're developing uh we have a call tomorrow actually about one of them that we want to preview with the bid in the chamber um so i think we're thinking along those lines um you know i'll be honest you know struggling with the idea of the economic development director position because it's a vacancy it's a it's a high salary position and you know, I, I really am working hard to avoid layoffs and hiring, but I understand that the this might be the time when you really need someone. So um, that's just one I haven't advertised for at this point in time, and I'm struggling with it a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna make sure that other people that haven't asked questions yet get a chance. Peter Demling. Um, yeah, uh, my question's about capital planning for FY21. So I saw that you still had JCPC making a recommendation on June 1st up there. And um, I mean, we haven't met since this all started and um, since the you know, at-homeness started. And I'm, I'm just wondering, since, since the guiding principle is pretty clearly make that number as small as humanly possible, um, is, and, and the JCPC's mission is to make a recommendation to you, um, 
is, do you still feel like that's, you know, in the next few weeks, a useful exercise for people to be spending their time and energy on? Or, or at this point, is, is it just so much of an exception year that that, that process doesn't make, make uh, as, as the same amount of sense it usually does? Mm -hmm. So previously, we had been thinking that it, 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 if we were doing such few, so few things on capital that we wouldn't need it. But you know, today we actually just had a conversation, and it's good to have Sean on board to say maybe there is an opportunity here to engage JCPC as we have some funds that we can allocate. And how would these be these limited funds be allocated? There are going to be some additional expenses that are going to be requested by uh, different bodies to accommodate the new reality. Um, so we anticipate that coming from, uh, you know, all three entities actually, uh, four entities, and um, and how do you want to weigh? How do you? How should we weigh those things? So, you know, again, Sean and Sonia and I haven't really had an explicit conversation, but I think I would. I'm thinking rethinking that whether the JCPC actually has a, a pretty important role this year for the smaller, for, for this even though it's a smaller amount. I just want to weigh in because I'm chair of JCPC, as Peter knows, and you know we we had tentatively, and I wanted to talk to Paul and Sonia of after the 18th, we'll have gotten a better sense of what that allocation is looking like, and calling a meeting of JCPC after in that week um, to talk conceptually about how much money and what kinds of um, information we're going to need from the various sources on what is the absolute minimum and why do they need it? Okay. Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. You know, this is not quite uh, a question uh, about the budget per se, but you talked in the beginning, Paul, about the um, homeless folks who were doing well and did not need to go to Hampshire College. Uh, but I'm wondering what's happened with our home, homeless population now and what impact that might have on current expenditures. Yeah. Um, so typically what happens at this time of year, um, the shelter closes and people are experiencing homelessness or truly experiencing homelessness and um, they're on their own and the, and the town hasn't done anything other than the sort of food offerings that have happened in the past. Um, we have had conversations about what it's, what the town can do. Um, and there are going to be some definite needs and, um, supports that folks experiencing homelessness are going to require. Um, and, um, so, uh, we don't have good answers for these things. We're identifying the needs. Um, we've talked with different uh, nonprofit vendors, people who provide the services uh, to see if they can help us out. It's definitely something that we need to seek funds for and to address. So I don't, that's not a great answer, Pat. I'm sorry, but it's just where we are. I want to add to that, however, because just this past week, uh, Paul and I uh, met with um, Mandy, Mindy Dom and with um, Joe Comerford. Uh, because of constituent concerns they had heard as well. And during that conversation, we really emphasized the fact that homelessness is not just a responsibility of Amherst, it's a regional responsibility. And that we need to have them work with others in the region to figure out how best we can coordinate Greenfield, uh, Amherst and, and, um, New and Northampton. And that it's not, we don't, pay for the shelter with the town. Uh, the biggest problem for now with the whole homeless population for the town, as you know, is that they don't have the library to go to. They don't have the senior center to go to. They cannot go inside the uh, survival center. So a lot of the places they would normally go to on bad weather days or colder days have just not been available. But the issue is something that both uh, Joe and Mindy are keeping an eye on and have agreed that they will talk to their counterparts in our region uh, to see whether we can come up with a better regional solution than we have thus far. Um, I, some of these other, I, there, I, I also want to go back to Shalini's question and just say that um, since the bid and the chamber were with us last week at the council meeting, 
Um, I've taken their uh, presentation. I've developed a chart. Many of you are quite familiar with my charts um, and started to look at what are the different things that they've asked, what could the action be, and who needs to be involved in terms of is it the town uh, administration or is it a committee or a subcommittee of the council and so forth. And so I hope, uh, and Paul has been working with that on, on that with me. So we'll hope to be bringing that back to the council and with more concrete ways on how to move forward. So uh, Lee Edwards, you have not spoken yet. Yeah, um, I, maybe I've been reading too much post-apocalyptic fiction, but, and you touched on this a little bit when you talked about capital projects, but is there any thinking COVID-19 may be the first of what may be a series of pandemic events and that there's maybe a, you know, a need to think about how not to be quite so flat footed in the future as all of us have been in the face of this one. I mean, as we go forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question, Lee. Um, you know, I've been thinking a whole lot about the fall um, and what's that going to look like. And I think, you know, as I worry about, you know, the weather turning, people experiencing homelessness, not having, and more people experiencing that. Um, and we talk about food insecurity for people who don't have jobs. And, you know, we've had this great surge of interest and effort by a lot of people, both government and um, nonprofits and uh, volunteers and donors. But if this becomes a sustained event or something that has their second bump, you know, this fall or another, how are we going to manage that? And that's something that we have to keep thinking about. That's, I, I sort of feel like food insecurity is probably one of our hard, highest level of um, issues that we're going to have to be really focused on in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, Darcy Dumont. Darcy, please unmute. I, uh, I thought some of those same thoughts, Lee, um, and I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm encouraged um, that we're thinking about um, um, how we should not be thinking that we'll necessarily have the same assumptions um, for our expenditures in the new post-COVID-19 era. Um, I hope that we can really focus on making the town resilient to both the continuation or recurrence of something like COVID-19 and also just resilience around our general vulnerabilities around climate impacts and uh, with what we've learned from COVID-19 and our new uh, climate goals and climate plans that we're gonna be coming up with for buildings and transportation, energy, land use, agriculture, and all of those things that are coming down the line to try to help us be more resilient. We real, I feel like we really need to be thinking about shifting our priorities in general about our uh, finances and um, supporting some of those plans that can bring us local jobs and so on. And that uh, I, I can see where the FY21 budget is you know, going to be definitely problematic. But as far as the FY22 budget, think of thinking about making some major shifts in the way we're thinking about um, our own resilience as a town to things like this happening. Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have. I don't know if it's a question observation, but I'm thinking about as I do both the schools and the library. Um, and I'm thinking about the magnitude of making these buildings ready in social distancing and the cost around what that's going to look like. And so much that's unknown. I mean, we don't even know what that looks like at this point. It's all untested. And so I'm trying to figure out, do we have some way of sort of 
Like at some point we have to make some decisions and we have to come up with some estimates based on the best information that we have. And so I don't know if that's part of what finance committee is doing, but do we have some sort of roadmap or timeline around expenses related to coming back into the building? I, I mean, I don't even know, I don't even know how to phrase the question because it's such an unknown, massive question. And, you know, that's because I'm in a library in a second grade classroom. So I just think the absolute worst in terms of, you know, hands and mouths and what it looks like all the time around me. So um, I guess I, it, it would just, for me, I guess it's helpful if, if at the library we have some idea of like by this date, you know, you, you know what you know and you've got to come up with the estimate based on, I mean, I know that that's what the budget is, but they, like just the, the extra cost around COVID and, and coming back into the buildings, I guess, is separate and apart from an operating budget. So I'm just trying to wrap my brain around how you even yeah. come up with that number or when. So, so I'll answer, but I know Mike has a lot to say on this because, and Sharon may as well, because um, they've been doing a lot of thinking about that, what the school look like in the fall. And, um, you know, for us, it's not, it's our first cut from the town point of view is how do we make sure our employees are here and socially distanced and safe? Are they able to do their jobs and be safe? And what, what do we have to, ha what do we, what's it look like for that to happen? And we can do that physical barriers. We can do it temporally by changing times that people are working, things like that. So there's different ways to do it. But what we have to address in terms of town hall is really simple relatively compared to what, you know, Mike and Sharon have to deal with. So I know Mike wanted to talk on this. Well, uh, Mike, go ahead. Sure. So I'll just be brief because we'll we'll be talking about this at school committee meetings from now um, forever, actually. Uh, <laughs> but starting starting this week. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we are doing, we do have a, a health grant, and we are um, purchasing some materials this spring out of that grant, not through appropriation, to try out some things. Uh, what we know is that we won't get guidance from um, anybody in time for this fiscal uh, process to play out. Um, so, you know, what I will be sharing with the school committee is some placeholder costs that we we made some assumptions, much like the town made some assumptions in putting together this proposal, um, because we know it won't be school, you know, school as normal. Uh, you know, Quebec opened today. We've seen some European uh, countries and other countries in Asia open up. And so we're actively following and learning from them. And we actually have some staff groups forming uh, this week. Uh, to start thinking about what that looks like, uh, you're exactly right. There's there, the number of unknowns is greater than the number of knowns, but there are some things that are even if we can't be specific in itemizing costs, there are some things that we know we're going to have to do differently with entrances, exits, hand washing. Right? There's some other ones that are big ticket items that we just it's impossible to predict. So you know the way we're thinking about it is trying to take some of our known costs, uh, some of our unknowns, working with our facilities department, uh, and taking a reasonable best guess. Um, I think the state has a large interest in schools opening. And so um, we know that at some point they're going to give us guidance. And that what we also know is that guidance is going to change over time, as we've seen even over the last two months. Um, sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but I think it's a really critical question because uh, one something I keep on saying, and I think this is true for the libraries, I don't want to speak for Sharon, but I'm guessing she would agree with me. There's a public health issue that we have to deal with. And then there's also a public confidence issue that we have to deal with. Right, and they're not equally important, but we have to get them both right if we're going to operate schools and libraries. And sorry, I'm going to speak, Sharon. If you disagree with me, I apologize. Um, uh, we have to get them both right. So part of that is engaging the community. Part of that's getting best um, best information from experts and authorities. Part of that's you know getting some guidance and then always applying it to our local environment. So much like the Jones, our buildings aren't designed with the most modern features in terms of when you walk in the building there's X, right? It, it, the X isn't always where you want the X to be, whatever the X is when you go into our buildings and our libraries. Um, so it's an active conversation. It'll need to be an active conversation. We'll need to have multiple opportunities for the community to weigh in uh, with their comfort level. And um, it, it has huge implications for us. And we have to get that right. Uh, again, both on the public health side as well as public confidence side. So I could talk forever on this. I'll stop. But um, it, it's something that uh, we're working on uh, literally all the time in every conversation. Sharon? Yeah, Mike, I never disagree with you. So <laughs> I agree with everything you just said. Um, I, you know, similar to Paul's slide, the, what was it? Which quote was it? Churchill? Um, this is just the beginning of 
I don't know, the end of the beginning or something like that. Um, we, I will be, um, I am presenting to the trustees uh, budget figures for FY21 that are including, you know, money for masks and plexiglass and bleach and wipes and things like that. And, you know, the, sta the staffing will be, have to be staggered for probably for a very long time and, and, and all of that. So um, there's a lot of placeholder costs and the same thing with the schools. You know, there's a, a library group working statewide on um, the best way to re-enter and, um, you know, the costs will come into play. So, you know, we just, there's so much we don't know, but we talk about it all the time. <laughs> Um, so, uh, let's see, Dorothy Pam. All right. So this is a question for Mike. Um, assuming that the public schools do open in the fall, and I'll just interject that Holyoke Community College has definitely decided that it is not opening for person to person classes. We're totally remote. Do you foresee, uh, a lot of retirements from teachers, um, Actually, the group that seemed to look worse to me recently was the 50, um, 50 to 69 year old group. But do you foresee retirements coming up um, if some teachers might decide it's too dangerous for them to return to the public school? Is that a good answer, Lynn? Uh, please. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we have not seen, we were sort of waiting for that and we do have an early retirement program that we um, are prone to use. And this year we, we, we did uh, make some offers. Uh, I think the other factor that plays out in retirement for many people um, is financial. And right now, um, financially, lots of people are getting advice not to retire because, um, because of the impact on stock markets and uh, things that I'm not so good at knowing about. So uh, we, we are looking for that. I, I've heard people make some of those predictions. We're not seeing any real change from what we anticipated two, three months ago. That may shift uh, over the next few months, but um, to date, we have not seen much changing in that regard. Okay. Um, Austin, you had your hand up and you've taken it down probably because of lack of patience. Austin? All right, I'm gonna go on to Kathy Shane. Okay, I, I had a question because um, Alyssa brought up the large library project. Is there any possibility that we could get help from our legislative representatives to get the granting authority to either postpone the award or give us longer than six months to make a decision because it's coming in as it's currently due in the first six months of what is likely to be the most uncertain and tightest budget we've got where we've had to make big capital quests. So it's it's a question on if if they could say you have a year to decide or we'll, we'll wait and give the award later. Um, so I don't know what behind the scenes efforts have been and whether it might help to put pressure at the political level of how tough it is for a municipality now. That was my question. Sharon, it's up to you if you wanna jump in on that. Sure, I, I, I would actually love for either Alex or Austin to respond. And if, I don't know if Mindy, I know she's on the phone. I don't know if she can- She's on the phone and we're not gonna bring her in on this time. Okay. Uh, we, can, we can move to that question next week when she's actually with us as part of the discussion. But Alex or Austin? Well, may I just say, this is a, there's a large question the town has to face. And I'm not going to talk about what Mindy or Joe might do. And, and that is, I guess I call it strategic investments. This is may, may be about the library and not about the library. And um, there's only so much that we can do to control what happens uh, at the state level. But the town as a whole is going to have to think in tough times about uh, where the most imp important investments are going to be. I mean, I think the worst thing the town could be would be just to draw back and stick its head in a hole and to say we can't do anything, which I think would be a long-term disservice to the town and actually a short-term disservice to the people who live in the town now. And that's going to play out across the town. So um, we, 
we, we can have conversations with the MBLC. We can ask the MBLC through our legislative delegation to do what it's going to do. But whatever the MBLC does, the town is going to have to develop a set of what are its strategic investment priorities going to be. Uh, it, you know, this is not a bad time actually to be borrowing money and building things. So I think that's the larger frame within which the conversation about the library should occur. And we know that library usage, Alex is going to say this, library usage is going to go up. The demand for the library is going to go up as it always does in tough, uh, tough times. But I think the question is a broader one about the town's uh, strategic investments. Alex, did you want to add to that, please? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> okay. Um, Alyssa, you have your hand up. This is perhaps something of a follow-up on what Dorothy said. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. And that is, as you know, everyone is figuring this out, right? The town isn't alone, but you know, nobody has it figured out yet. Luck luckily, you know, Mike talked about other countries, et cetera. But one of the things I want to make sure we get reported out to us at some point, not of course tonight, is what the thinking is around accommodating current employees, not people who have any intention of retiring. Everyone's retirement accounts are in the toilet anyway, so no one can afford to retire. So what about accommodating employees with underlying conditions? When I mean normally well-controlled conditions, there are plenty of town employees, just like there are town counselors, including myself, who might have one or more of the following conditions, like asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart condition, immune disorders, obesity. All those things, they do their jobs every day. Pre-COVID, no problem. With COVID, even with social distancing, there are going to be people who are rightfully frightened of going back to work. So that seems to add a whole nother layer to this. You know, it's, it's not just a matter of, of, of staggering people, you know, because they're all kind of in the same boat. There are going to have to be additional accommodations beyond that. And so I think as this unfolds, if we could just share, if the staff could just share some of the thinking with that best practices elsewhere as we do that, because we cannot put people in a position, right, of saying, well, if you can't go back in the classroom where the kids lick all the toys, then I guess we don't have a job for you. So. Any thoughts on that for many of our superintendent at Paul um, Sharon? Yeah, so um, yes, that's exactly the type of thing, you know, that everybody's struggling with and there's 351 cities and towns are all having the same conversation. Our HR director is on multiple listservs where everyone's thinking through and it's not just classrooms, it's people working at DPW, it's, it's everybody. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, a, it's a dastardly disease, it's insidious and um, you know, unless you're wearing PPE all the time, it's, you just have to be so, so super careful. And until the science catches up and the testing catches up or we get a vaccine, we're just gonna be in this wacky area and trying to figure out how these things work. And the way HR things and collective bargaining things all overlay everything, it just creates an incredible level of complexity. Um, and I just, again, when I look at our town, I think so thankful that we have people who are, leaders in a lot of our organizations who are on those boards having the conversations at the state level you know, saying what's this what's this look like um because it's it's an active conversation steve schreiber you have your hand up and thanks for joining us yeah thanks for having me um yes yeah, so i just want to make the case for actually the good timing of the library because one it's really hard to think of a more egalitarian you know, structure than a public library. It's welcoming to everyone. So it's, you know, it's, um, and I think that that's been really clear to everyone since the middle of March about how unfortunate it was that the libraries had to close because it gave away, we um, lost shelter, we lost access to the internet, we lost access to all kinds of resources. So for me, the fact that we're so high up on the list now for a major renovation slash addition is extraordinarily exciting. So all of that said, I did go to the, I think it was early March um, design presentation. We we're all crowded in the basement room. And so there's a couple of thoughts about that. Like, what were we thinking? We were all crowded in this room when COVID was in the, you know, we didn't know, but it was just, you know, sort of an extraordinary that 
the things that we didn't know at that time. But that also gets me thinking that because we didn't know what a library, a renovated library, or what a, we didn't know what the threats were at the time. So it's hard to see us moving forward with the design of the library as is without now considering what pandemics and epidemics, how that might change the thinking about that. So I, I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but on one hand, I think we should be gung-ho moving forward with the library. But I also think that we really need to take a serious look about um, how would a now that we know what the threat of a pandemic like this is, how would we redesign it? Like what would spaces look like in a post-pandemic era? So I hope we can do both of those, move forward with the library, but then also take another look. Andy Steinberg. Yes, um, I waited until the uh, close to the end of the meeting to just say something as chair of the finance committee. We are meeting tomorrow, as has been alluded to several times. We've got a lot on our uh, plate to deal with in um, asking additional questions about today's meeting, coming to a firm understanding about sort of the greater details um, that uh, committee members may feel that they need to have. Thinking about the question of what is most essential in the one month budget, we were very uh, strategic in recommending to the council um, that we have a one month budget and to the FY21 budget with a little bit more time. So uh, there's a lot on our plate. I wanted to assure uh, members of the public who are still lo uh, listening that we will have a brief public comment period tomorrow. We did not have public comment built into today's agenda, but it is built into the agenda for tomorrow. Um, if people um, who are uh, participating in this meeting from the three elected boards or um, anyone else has questions that they would like to make sure get at least considered, um, they certainly can um, email them in. And uh, I uh, want to thank everybody who's been involved in this process so far. You know, I've been involved in uh, town government in one capacity or another for 20, 25 years, and a lot of it in budget sites with Finance Committee Select Board, now on the council. Um, this is really unprecedented time. I don't think that I, have um, even in 2008, 2009, um, it doesn't touch a candle to what we're dealing with now. Um, and um, we need a group working together, and I think we have a great group that is working together, and thank you. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? And uh, Paul or Mike or Sharon, any other comments? I, I'd just like to thank everybody for their time and their good questions. So I think we have a lot of work, as Andy said, and glad that he's here <laughs> to help. Uh, as someone said, I think <laughs> one of the local businesses said, uh, we're not all in the same boat, but we're all in the same storm. So I think that's where we are. Right. I also want to mention that Doug Slaughter was on that uh, finance committee at the same time as Andy. And so he comes in with a little bit of that uh, moment of saying, oh my heavens, do we have to go here again? And yes, we do. I want to thank all of you. Uh, this is the launch of a very, very tough time for us. Uh, we knew it was coming. The, we decided we'd throw a little cold water on everybody's thinking just to get going. But the one thing I know is that Amherst will make it through. We're a good town and we'll do it. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask Austin to adjourn the council. I mean, your uh, trustees. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn from the trustees? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, the trustees are adjourned. Since, since we don't have to actually have a vote, I won't make you do a roll call. Um, so Alex, you're okay with that? Okay. Uh, Allison. Unmute. Sorry, I was muted. Um, do I have a motion from the school committee? 
I move to adjourn. Second. second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Lord. Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling? Uh, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. We're adjourned. Okay. And we do it a lot different in the council. So the council meeting is adjourned. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Thanks.